Um, and then because I'm I'm singing a lot with the bass, so that's another thing that I'm working on is coordinating the two. And that was the thing that I didn't think would be as difficult as it was. I was I just remember trying to sing a jazz standard that I've been singing for like the last 10 years, and I couldn't the melody wouldn't come out. I couldn't remember the words. It was just the, a complete. It was like the the song had gone from my brain, trying to play bass at the same time. I've had such a great time learning about today's guest and her journey. So cool. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting today with Erica Bremham, who is from Melbourne, Australia. She is a multi-instrumentalist. She's a composer. She's a singer, and she has recently picked up the bass, which has been quite a journey for her, and that's what we're talking about today. I'm a big fan of what she's doing, and I love how she tackles projects, these long-term projects. Her base project is called the Dryad Project. We talk about why she called it that, and it's very inspiring. Uh, so I'll let her <laughs> describe that. Um, but she also did a Song a Day project, the Song Chain Project. And I just love her approach to creativity and to a kind of scheduling creativity and good habits that, that get you uh, creating consistently and pushing your boundaries. These are among my favorite topics to talk about. So today's chat was very fun for me, and I know you'll enjoy it too. You're going to hear Erica singing along with her partner, Adam Spiegel, playing bass. That's a track called A Low Heavy Sun, and I just know you're going to have a great time listening to this episode. Quick shout out to our sponsors. Thank you so much to Diderio Strings, Otava Imports, Steve Swan String Bass, Modacity, Colstein Music, A440 Violin Shop, and Upton Bass String Instrument Company. More on them later, but let's dive into this conversation with the totally fascinating Erica Bremen. One A low heavy sun is melting into a golden horizon A breeze tries to undress us and all of Well, thanks for reaching out. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no, all good. I've been enjoying the podcast a lot, oh. actually. Oh, I, I, I think I have to say I started listening to it before I even picked up the double bass. I was kind of bass curious. Really? So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, so I was, I was like watching some YouTube videos and I found the podcast and had a little bit of a listen to well, I, awesome. oh, that's great. Well, I think we probably know a few, pe- at least a few people in common, like Ben Puglisi, uh, I know is in. Oh, yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. yep. So, and, and I don't know if you know or if you've met Rob Nairn, but I know that he's teaching at the University of Melbourne now. Um, he's a Yeah, rich- I don't think I've met him. He's great. Is, is he from the classical world or the jazz world uh he's he's in he may have some jazz background but he's pretty much yeah. in the classical world but he's, all, and yeah. he's also in the early music world he lived yeah, in, okay, the, cool. in the states for a long time and played with the handel and haydn society or something like that and yeah, then okay. and then uh opportunity came up to get back home and so he's there and i actually yeah. am going to come out in november this year to melbourne uh and oh, awesome. For, yeah awesome. so it'll be my first time in australia so <laughs> yeah um I, and that event, I think it's an open to all. So I'll let you know when that event gets uh, yeah, definitely. firmed up. I think, actually, I think I have the date here. Uh, it is. So I don't know what I'm doing yet, but I know that I'm at least going to that. It's, um, oh yeah, November 24th. So it's a Sunday yep. in November. Okay, perfect. Perfect. It'll be warm. You'll have a break from the winter. Yeah, I know. I would I would appreciate that much more if I was still living in Chicago. Now I live in San yeah, that's Francisco. True. <laughs> so, but it's it's always kind of light jacket weather out here. Yeah, yeah. So, well, well, it's been fun. It's been fun. I, so I've gone through and sort of uh, checked in with with your bass project, which is which is awesome. And then I love this uh, song chain project you were doing before. Oh yeah, that's a that's a that's a super cool idea too. And you got far, right? You got a couple hundred songs. Yeah, in. I think so. so yeah, one hundred and eighty. I think. Wow. That's a great project. I tried to do yeah. that myself with, um, I used to teach this class on electronic music and I got into yeah. a habit of putting together one 
thing at least 30 yeah. seconds long a day and i had a nice yeah. little i did not have 180 days in a row but i yeah. had you know i got a, i got 30 in or so but what a cool yeah. project i love i love projects like that it's really uh yeah it's wild yeah and, i found it was really good for my um i don't know just getting over any writer's block that you might have because you just force yourself to create something and you stop just judging what you're creating which was really nice which is kind of been good for learning a new instrument as well trying not to judge what you're producing on that day i'll bet i'll bet it's been it's great what a great habit to get into whether it's writing or learning a new instrument or one of mine these days is practicing spanish i'm on day two, oh, sure. 255 i think today was of practicing yeah. spanish and i still yeah. can't speak spanish but i can speak it a lot better than yeah. i could 255 yeah, yeah, yeah. days ago <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah awesome and and so and and so uh you've got this so you've been playing a little over a year at this point yeah on bass just just over a year may i think was my one year okay bass anniversary okay that's awesome and and um i don't i i guess we're going now i, I have no idea how the you know when, i just start talking to people and then at a certain point yeah, that's fine. i that's guess fine. we're talking <laughs> they're not the typical disclaimer they're not live at all so if you want to restate or say anything or whatever yeah it's, yeah it's, that's it's fine. your show that's fine. So, no i figure you're you uh, but um so all sorts of interesting things we can talk about as i'm looking at these videos i see some george vance books on the piano i think oh um, yeah yeah Okay, and I've only just started with those. I've been doing mainly Rabath stuff mm -hmm. with well, my teacher because she's a Rabath teacher, but then okay. she's just started me on a couple of the Vance exercises. Those are well. very, that's a fun approach, you know, getting in that way. Um, yeah. And, and especially, it's a very melodic way to, to learn an instrument. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've found it, at least with, with the students that I've taught, the, especially the younger crowd, um, it's, a, it's a very... Um, user-friendly way to get into the instrument you're yeah. playing you yeah. know fifths and sixths and it's very uh yeah. you know much uh i think i think people who pick up in it, uh the bass later in life they're a little more maybe tolerant of yeah uh, of, wor of working the grinding yeah of the, of the grind there we go yeah <laughs> um well, maybe we should. Just, so, so uh, I'd love to talk about the song project and other things too. But maybe just why bass? What what do you think yeah. drew you to the bass? Um. It originally, I don't know, it was my partner is a bassist and he had a second bass that he's been trying to sell for maybe two and a half years and it wasn't getting any bites. So I thought maybe I'll pick it up and have a tinkle on it. And then, yeah, just something about it kind of grabbed me and I was suddenly, that's all I was doing was practicing bass. And, and it was also, I'd had a conversation because I, I am a vocalist and I, was, I always find it hard to book bassists for mm. gigs because everybody's busy. And I'd just come off a little tour with a friend playing mandolin for his kind of singer-songwriter project, and it was really nice being a sideman. So I thought maybe bass was a good way of being a sideman and getting other people to book me rather than me having to book other people for gigs all the time. <laughs> I... I... Yeah, well, you're you're always in demand as a bass player. There never seems yeah, to be enough. Yeah. Doesn't matter where you are here in San Francisco or yeah. smaller towns that I've lived in. You know, it's uh, that. Um, so I think I read uh, that you somewhere on your site that it's also been like remarkably challenging. The most yeah, challenging is yeah. what you ever picked up, I think. Yeah, you said definitely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, talk about that. Um, because I, I play guitar. I've got a degree in jazz voice, but I've always played guitar. That's kind of been my accompaniment instrument, much more so than piano, which is maybe unusual for a lot of jazz singers. Most of them gravitate towards the piano. And then I played mandolin and I was working quite seriously on that for a while, but it's mandolin is much more of an obscure instrument, so there's less work for a mandolinist, I guess, so it was kind of just for my own pleasure. And yeah, the bass is just, it's just even the kind of first steps building up enough strength to be able to press the strings down and get a decent sound. It's just, it's, it's really frustrating because it's just time. The only thing that can make it better is spending a lot of time with the instrument. You can't shortcut it. You definitely can. I remember my, I started on violin, played for yeah. several years. And then I remember my first bass lesson. I was, I don't know, 12 or something like that. And my orchestra teacher, who was a violinist herself, yeah. said, all right, let's pull out this bass. And it was some nasty old thing, you know, <laughs> get the rural, you know, America uh, with strings. I, they, they seemed impossibly high. They were probably too high, but who knows? Yeah. And I just remember thinking like, what? 
is this thing? I, could, I couldn't make a sound. She couldn't make a sound. It was like this sort of hilarious, like neither of us had an idea how to make it work. So I feel your pain. Uh, I do remember at a certain point, not, you know, a, being able to make a sound, but yeah, yeah those, those yeah. early, early moments are really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And even, cause now even a year in, it's still, I think maybe having a musical background is that I'd know what I would like to sound like, but it's quite frustrating how slow it is to get to that point. And having worked with so many amazing bass players, you've got that benchmark as well. And so I've really set myself a, a high <laughs> challenge to work towards. <laughs> Well, and I think that's the, that is such a challenge for people who pick something up as an adult. And that's, I, yeah. and, and I've, I've worked with a bunch of people over the years that are proficient in some other instrument that pick up the bass. And it's, and, and yeah, it's like, it seems, and, and bass has been my life aside from those first few years yeah. in the violin. So I have kind of a warped perspective, but, but I've heard that from other people too, where they come to the bass and they think, it's, you know, are they hitting two strings or, yeah. you know, the, just, just the, the unique challenges of pulling a good sound yeah. on the bass. Yes. Yeah. 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 What, what, so, so, um, and, and uh, we have a lot of people who are uh, adult learners, whatever you want to call it, you know, that listen to podcasts. So I'm sure that they will be listening and identifying strongly. Um, yeah. but like, what are some, what are some of those, uh, Maybe what? Maybe we could think like, what are some of the biggest challenges you remember right when you started out, and then what are some of those things that you still think like, ugh, why is this so hard on the bass? Like, yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah. Tell me about those. Um, I think because I've I was originally thinking maybe I'll play some jazz on the bass, but then I picked up a bow, and suddenly that was what I was really into. And just getting a nice sound with the bow takes so much time. And I've been having weekly lessons with a teacher for the year that I've been learning and so it's been very directed practice but still just I think even just in the last week I had a, a bit of a breakthrough with not lifting weight out of the bow and it's taken me a year to for that breakthrough so it's yeah um, that was a big one and just still intonation is such a challenge and it's such an ongoing challenge and just I guess finding the notes on the black expanse of the of the fretboard and um, I think I, I probably have an advantage of being a vocalist because there's a lot of similarities between finding, I guess, the kind of oral training that you do as a vocalist and moving that over to bass. I can imagine that would be more challenging for someone with limited musical and oral experience because you've kind of got to pre-hear the notes and, and know what an in-tune scale sounds like to be able to play an in-tune scale. But that's also, it means that I know when I'm out of tune and I, I just that cringe and I'm really working on not I guess tensing up every time I play a dodgy screech or an out of tune note just really trying to relax into the instrument yeah that's I that's got to be one of the biggest challenges because I, I could see you know I, when I've worked with people I could see that sort of tensing up because you hear the yeah. sound you know you don't yeah. want that sound and I've had a few yeah. a few different students that 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 will have like some particular thing that just drives them crazy one I remember yeah. it was like any scratch in the bow at all any yeah. sort of like burble or you know just like yeah. crud in the sound um and, and I I wonder if maybe just like people starting when they're when they're young children, maybe it just bothers them less, or they've had just that. Yeah, probably. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just they're just they're just more willing to go for it. They don't really care. They're happy to be yeah. making any sound at all. Yeah, like that one. I and and talk about intonation. I I had another uh, student who playing the bass as an adult who uh, it was it was intonation his standard of intonation was so much higher than my standard like he plays something that's like <laughs> it's pretty in tune and he's like it's not exactly in tune I'm thinking well it's not exactly in tune but yeah. there are like 20 other things we should talk about like it's close enough in yeah. tune let's talk about yeah. like relaxing your yeah. shoulders and yeah. and just getting that ease with the instrument that, that's, that's like yeah. one of the major seems like such a major struggle just figuring out yep. how to yep. how to use the body or unlock or, yeah and you've been working with yep. the teacher you've been you've you yeah. you're, you're musical you have a background like what have you been what have you in terms of getting the weight into the bass or, or, or getting the weight into the bow arm or anything else like what what have you sort of discovered that's worked for you maybe like a practice technique or some sort of like way of thinking about things any any tips yeah. you might want to share with people listening um one thing that I've been working on more recently is just making things sound musical. So I've been singing what I want to play and 
because there was a big disconnect between when I was, you know, singing a line and it sounded really musical and then on the bass it didn't sound musical at all. So I'm trying to then translate that that level of, I guess, like singly phrasing to the instrument, which I still haven't been able to accomplish. It's still, there's, it, it's not happening. Um, I, working a lot with relaxing and just accepting the sounds from the instrument. My teacher's very into talking about how any sound is useful. You can, it's, it's just the wrong tool for the job at that time. So you can put it away in your toolbox for use later. Um, that's really helpful. And then, yeah, just, um, lots of I guess stretching I'm doing a lot more physical exercise than I used to before I picked up the bass I've started running fairly consistently and stretching and really trying to make sure that my body doesn't just break down because of the physicality of the instrument because my partner is a he's been a double bassist for maybe the last 15 years and he's been dealing with some um like I guess just physical issues which he's managed to get under control so I was aware of the that side of the instrument so I'm trying to take care but it's hard when you're busy practicing and gigging to find the time sometimes oh it could be it could be very hard to find the time that's for sure I you know it's interesting because I back when I if we go back 20 years or something uh, I think I did a lot of stretching and and I sort of had this routine of like yeah. all sorts of motions before I played the bass but I think I wasn't exercising a lot more and these days yeah. I, I don't know if this is good or bad but these days I'm exercising much more consistently so I, yeah. and and running and stuff but my routine at the bass I don't spend as much time like doing anything specific before I pick up the bass it's more like yeah. picking, picking up the bass and then playing slow bows and then I sort of imagine yeah. like this blue laser going up and down my body just sort of like checking in with yeah. the muscle groups so that seems yeah, okay, to be cool. that seems to be working I don't know if it's I don't know if it's good yeah or I'm, bad, I'm gonna try that okay <laughs> <laughs> that, I I've I've been getting uh, uh really into some of these discover double bass courses which i think a lot of adult yeah. learners have picked up and david allen moore who teaches out here in california he's in the los angeles philharmonic he has a great one on on well he has two he has one on left hand technique and then he has one on german bow and i play french bow but whatever it's it's about yeah. the bow and yeah. i've been th i've been watching those and thinking a, a little bit about what just the words he uses he's just such a good teacher and yeah. he's an ultra marathon runner and he thinks really deeply about just you know yeah. physicality and the instrument but it's interesting so so um I, talk talk through like what you're doing on a like what's a day of practicing look like for you these days you get out the base yeah what what do you what do you what are you doing with your time um i still do a lot of open string exercises with the bow so that's i usually just start with open strings um long notes to begin with and then i've got some i guess rhythmic exercises so working on different bow divisions and working on things like i guess connection at the beginning of the notes at the both ends of the bow Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I kind of work on a scale. I, I found that I need to spend like probably a month on a, on a key to really get comfortable with the, I guess, the different fingerings. And because I've been going through the Rabath fingerings from book three and there's like heaps of fingerings for every key. So I, I've just maybe concentrate on one or two a day and really work on um, the intonation that way. And then I have been trying to do more pizzicato practice recently because that was what I was just, it's, I've done a few jazz gigs and they just have always been like a week of frantic practice beforehand <laughs> because I've been neglecting it a little bit. So that's, I'm, I'm making a concerted effort at the moment to do a little bit of that practice. Um, just getting um, kind of some more dexterity in both fingers because I find that my second finger is just a bit uncoordinated and slow at the moment. Um, and then because I'm, I'm singing a lot with the bass, so that's another thing that I'm working on is coordinating the two. And that was the thing that I didn't think would be as difficult as it was. I, was, I just remember trying to sing a jazz standard that I've been singing for like the last 10 years and I couldn't, the melody wouldn't come out. I couldn't remember the words. It was just the, a complete, it was like the, the song had gone from my brain trying to play bass at the same time.
This episode is brought to you by the A440 Violin Shop. It's located just down the street from Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago on the north side, just off the Brown Line. I have been going there my entire adult life, and they have been fantastic, both for repairs. I've had cracks repaired. I've had seams glued. I've had all sorts of students go to A440 to get instruments, to get bows. They're available with a smile, do wonderful work, and definitely check them out if you are in the Midwest. A440violinshop.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Hey, Jason. How are you? Hope you're well. Um, thank you for asking me about the, the Dario strings and what do I like about the Dario strings. Um, well, I've been using them for about six or seven years. Um, I use the Zyx medium set. Um, what I like about it is that for me, it has provided a sort of like a really good compromise. I like the, the the feel under my fingers is great because it's sort of like a gutty feel. The strings are thicker than general uh, generally metal strings are. And I used to play with like an olive G before and spiracore. So it kind of like recreates that feel. And it's, their strings are loose, they're not super tight, like definitely a lot less tight than any of the Dario um, metal uh, steel strings. Um, and I really like that part about it, that it just like, I kind of feel like the synthetic core strings have like this um, gutty kind of feel. Um, then they have a depth to them that I really like. At the same time, they have also a nice um, attack especially for pizzicato jazz, pizzicato, which is what I do mostly. And at the same time, they also bow really well. My bow sticks to them greatly. Um, I do have to wash, clean the, the strings a few times if I'm bowing, because I like to cake my bow with quite a lot of rosin. Um, but overall, um, they're just a great uh, sort of like um, catch-all string for me. Um, I would say the only thing that it's perhaps not as great about them is that every six months uh, I feel like they start going out of tune and then I think that I'm playing out of tune and what's wrong with me? And it's like, oh, the strings must be wearing out. And then I uh, change them and then they're great again with the new set. Uh, so that's all. Love those Zyx strings. And I'm very, very happy to be the Dario artist. They're great people and um, very lucky about it. Thank you so much, Jason. Take care. There Bye. is this mode in my practicing app, Modacity, which I totally love. It's called Deliberate Practice. And it's such a cool feature. Here's Modacity founder and CEO, Mark Gelfo, on how this works. One of my pain points as a musician was like not really having a method to generate reliable improvement. And deliberate practice is like the scientific method for music practice. So what you do is you identify the one thing that you want to improve, be it articulation, intonation, emotion, comfort, whatever it is you want to improve, and brainstorm or choose one of the pre-suggested strategies for that area of improvement, and then test it out. Record yourself trying that strategy, listen back, and press yes, it worked or no, it didn't work to create that improvement. It's such a clean way of tracking your progress. I do it every day and it has done wonders for my bass playing and just my overall enthusiasm for music. You got to check it out. Modacity.co is the site. And if you go to our site, you can click through it and get a special offer for lifetime access for this app. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, Modacity. Well, how interesting that is because you would think, you know, because I'm, I mean, you do that doing that with guitar and voice, you would yeah, think that, yeah. it, you know, you're playing with, I know it's different. Different, but left yeah. hand and right hand they have similar functions but you yeah. found that like particularly yeah. challenging I think it was yeah it was the holding the two different melodies in my mind mm -hmm. at the same time so the melody of the bass line and the melody of the of the song because with guitar it's it's like I guess more rhythmic accompaniment if you're just chunking through chords you don't think so much about about the melody it's more so I, the rhythmic separation for me is okay but it's the melodic separation that I'm finding challenging but I've, I've managed to do it now so I've, I can sing through um, standards and play a decent walking bass line as long as I don't move out of probably like the first first I don't know what the positions are but like you know the top end of the, the or the bottom end of the 
base. Of the base. Yeah, like first position, yeah. the kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. Home, home base. Yeah. And the, if and I the, yeah, exactly. If I move if I move beyond that when I'm trying to sing, then the intonation gets kind of crazy, and then I just lose my focus on both things I'm trying to do. Well, it's interesting. I like I I, I a singer I am not. Um, but besides <laughs> singing for my students, but I've been and not to make this an advertisement for Discover Double Bass, but I guess it, but I've been getting into um, Katie Thoreau, this jazz bass. Yeah, I just bass. saw that. Yeah. Yeah, so she's been putting, okay, so you've seen, so folks who haven't seen, um, Katie Throw, great jazz uh, bassist and vocalist. She's out here in California. I had her on the podcast maybe a year ago, and she's putting out a course with Jeff Chalmers at Discover Double Bass, and she's got some really cool exercises for singing and playing the bass, and I was thinking yeah, about sure. just trying those, because I, yeah. not, not that I plan on doing any, you know, singing gigs in, in the future, but I just think it'd be interesting to um, sort of experience what that's like yeah it, yeah, it, yeah. Se- it seems very challenging to me but but yeah. it's interesting <laughs> that you who's somebody who that's that's like in your wheelhouse um that the bass is proven to be you know challenging in that way very cool um so the pizzicato thing is interesting uh when you're actually on a gig like so if i pl- i play a jazz gig like once every five years you know so it's yeah. a very um but what i do i have to really get in shape or i ab- i'm absolutely yeah. demolished yeah. you know first of yeah. all like blister you know blister city yeah. I, and, yeah. and and then yeah. i just don't i don't it, it's it's uh tiring jazz players i guess would realize this but since i do it every five years it's tiring in such a different way or it's physically yeah. demanding in such a different way than a classical gig which is more yeah, like definitely you know it's like a sprinting event or something for classical yeah like, like you're, yeah. you're you're resting or then you're doing something yeah you know, yeah versus that you know playing every single quarter note of every single tune exactly yeah that's it the walking thing is really exhausting you never get a break and if you stop then the the music kind of like <laughs> dies so you can't stop that's the <laughs> Um, and also I find it's, it's, it's physically harder to hold the strings down playing pizzicato, just that you don't have to use as much, as much strength with the bow. So I was, yeah, that, and I think the reason I have been avoiding practicing, practicing jazz is because it is a bit more physically challenging. And so it's, it's just been easier to pick up the bow. So I've just have to force myself over that little hurdle and put the time in. And I find actually in my practice, which I've, I've always done with especially with writing is using a like an egg timer and setting just if I really don't want to do something I just set a timer for five minutes and say five minutes I'm going to focus on this thing and then I can finish when the timer goes off which is it, a good procrastination buster uh it's a really good way to do it I have this practicing routine when I'm feeling not like doing any work I have yeah. one that's that I, I built beforehand in this app modacity that I use and I and it's like just like you said, like five minutes on everything. And I think yeah. like, oh, it's like one of those, it's, you know, if I get home, it's 4 p.m. on a Friday or something. And I, I want to get a little at a time in just so I, you know, yeah. you know, don't keep, keep it, keep it going. That I find super useful. And, and um, the, the, okay, so that's great. So, so using a timer, that's been helpful. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and then I also read that you started using the angled end pin, the labory yeah, end pin. Yeah, yeah. When, when did you Pretty discover? Early on. Okay, cool. So when, when did, yeah. when, what did you find? And I've been playing around with that myself. Uh, yeah. I have, I, I don't have my bass drilled, but I have a, this thing yeah. called the chromatic end and oh yeah, then, I've seen them. Yeah, too. yeah, and and it's been interesting. I I use a straight pin still most of the time, but I've been using yeah. that. Uh, what did you find uh, beneficial uh, to getting the angled end pin? Um, I, f- I because I start I got it maybe like two months after I started learning. I got one of the bent end pins, so the one that's that goes in the normal end pin hole. And then my partner was using that and he decided to try the, the full labori because he's been having back issues and so he thought maybe that would be a good way of trying to solve that problem. And then I tried that and it was like, oh, why am I using this straight end pin? This is so much more comfortable. But I think because it was so early on, like I don't know if I'd, if I'd stuck with the straight end pin if I would have felt, found that just as comfortable. But I find that I'm much more free with the instrument. I'm not juggling the weight of the instrument all the time because that was the, it was that, uh, that thing of like when you're trying to, I guess, you know, move over the, the heel of the instrument into thumb position, there's just that kind of hitch of the weight that you really have to juggle and that you're just trying to think of so many things at once. And so 
getting the labori it means that the instrument feels pretty much weightless when you're playing it and you can um yeah it just i i know that lots of people use straight in pins really effectively but i just feel like for me it would it wouldn't i couldn't go back that was i'm i'm hooked <laughs> yeah well it's 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 a amazing feel the 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 i've i've really enjoyed the feeling and and the, i think that that's I have this, there's this thing, I think the only reason I haven't completely gone over is just totally specific to me. I go around and I do all these events uh, at different places and I don't want to get used to something that's not like totally standard. And I know yeah. that's, a, that's a dumb yeah. reason because I could bring my uh, my chromatic end pen. I'll probably, yeah. I, I'll, yeah. maybe I'll change my mind. Who knows? Maybe I'll change my ne mind next week. But that's been, uh, that's part of why I started standing too a few years ago yeah. just because yeah. I, I used to sit all the time and then I would go somewhere and there wasn't a stool and I was like a fourth yeah. grader trying to get around. Yeah. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but it's it's that the feeling of, of freedom, uh, the, both getting to thumb position and then like your thumb, like not having any weight on it that was the big thing actually the weight on my thumb that's i was it just so much less hand pain mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep yep no it's smart okay it's something that something for people to consider and it's cool that you're using not the labry although the or not the 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 drilled end pin although that's obviously a great no option. i am using the drilled end oh pin i'm now. sorry you are yeah, okay yeah okay. yeah so i started with the bent one and then and then my partner got his base drilled and then I thought I'm going to go get my base drilled okay, as got well it. so yeah I've still got the bent end pin somewhere in my thing but I'm using the drilled and it's one of the adjustable ones so you don't you can adjust the height because I think the old school ones are just a wooden pin so you have to get it made mm -hmm. a specific size Exactly. And it doesn't work if you change your shoe your shoe height and your <laughs> intonation is all off. <laughs> yeah, you change your shoes, it doesn't work, you go barefoot. Yeah. Or you yeah. say, a colleague of mine uh, carries, you know, he has his sitting angled end pen and his standing one. Yeah. You give it to yeah. a student, it doesn't work. So yeah, it's, yeah. Co it's cool to have it, to have it adjustable. But it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful sense of freedom that it, that it gives the bass. Yeah. It's yeah. really, um, yeah. so, so you're all in on this bass. I'm yeah, I am, bit, yeah. right? You're 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 you've fall, fallen for the instrument and, and yeah, yeah. What I think uh, one thing I found, I was going to say one thing no, I found is that there's the community about around the bass is really is really nice and strong because I guess just compared to I don't know there's there's not that kind of community around I guess vocals or or guitar. There's so many singers and so many guitarists that it's hard to find your little sense of you know your people so I, that was possibly a big thing that that has kept me going with the bass it's a lovely it's a lovely community something about be, being that supportive role uh, you know it's a lot of reasons that who knows exactly why but yeah you're so right it's something in the classical world they say violinists get together and they have a competition bass players get yeah. together and they have a convention i think that there's yeah. <laughs> you know, not that there's no community in, in those other worlds yeah. but yeah, 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 yeah the bass world is is uniquely welcoming and it's a really exciting time uh to be yeah. a bass player too with the advances and the gear and you're exploring the raboth yeah. book which i think is such a yeah such a beautiful way of experiencing the instrument and yeah i love that you're going across and and taking the like like we could pick whatever what key are you doing right now for scales uh d Okay, so you're doing D, D and, and the, the Raboth approach that people don't know is in this third book or just, just when, when he's exploring scales in general is to more or less do the scale in every conceivable area of the bass, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so some of the positions are kind of weird and uncomfortable, but once you, once you work on those, then the easy ones become easier. And I guess one thing my teacher's often saying is you should practice the thing that feels most uncomfortable rather than... The, you know, it's easy. I find that because I teach guitar and singing and my students always do the easy thing. They don't practice the thing that's hard. Um, but practicing the thing that feels uncomfortable is, it makes the easy things even easier than they were to begin with. So yeah, I, I try and put time into the things that don't feel instinctive or, or comfortable right in the beginning. I, I hear you. It's so it, it's I equate it to working out in a lot of different ways, like strength yeah. training or something like that. You know, practicing all this stuff in the E string, and I love seeing my students. You know, the first time they do that, they're like, "What? Why am I doing?" And yeah. I say, "Trust me. We go to the G string, and it's going to be like butter." And also, yeah. that yeah. there's there's something about that Raboth approach to like really mapping out all the different areas of the keys. I find that it it 
it enhance it seems to enhance um, your all the creative possibilities on the bass. Like yeah. I work yeah. with people on that, and, or me myself, I, I practice that a lot, and and I get a new piece of music, uh, and all of a sudden I'm seeing all these options, and, and I can't help but think yeah. that it would be great for for someone in an improvised context too, because you, yeah. you all of a sudden instead of getting trapped like just going up and down the G string, you know, yeah. you see all these patterns across the bass. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing that I'm I'm still having trouble with is I'm I'm up the G string and up the D string now are feeling okay, but that kind of horizontal movement across the bass is still it's still a bit of a blurry kind of I don't know sort of a swampy in my brain. So I'm 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 trying to solidify my like imagination of the horizontal movement, which is it's silly because I play guitar, so I can like the horizontal movement on the guitar is there and except just something about the bass being vertical it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't map over i don't know it I hear you. So when I and I always get confused because I think guitar. So when we're thinking guitar and we're thinking bass, are you thinking of horizontal mo motion the same way? Like, are, like are you thinking of horizontal motion as being across the strings or across up and the down? strings? Yeah, okay. that's, yeah across that's, the strings. That's the way yeah. I think about it too. Although in a sense, I, I guess it could be. Right, it's always confusing when you're talking about these different yeah, angles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's yeah. funny. It's funny going across the strings like that. I do think is it's it's almost like an optical or a sensory illusion in some ways because yeah. as you're going up, the the distance between the strings is expanding and the fingerboard's expanding, yeah. but the notes are shrinking. So it really, yeah. in some ways, it's becoming easier, but it's also becoming more challenging, right? Like, yeah. And yeah. and when you yeah. get into thumb position, you that's where it's almost like an illusion. Where like I if I'm on the G string and I find a B natural in thumb position, so maybe yeah. second finger or third finger. Then you play yeah. that F sharp. That's starting to feel a little sharp. You know, it feels sharp compared to where it's on the G string. And so yeah. yeah, that that sense of place, I find, I find, and and working with students, it seems like really focusing in on those harmonics, like the harmonics that Raboth uses for positions, that yeah. seems to help yeah. a bit. But it it yeah. is a challenging thing. Yeah. And hand and just hand strength in general. Strength strength is a funny thing on the bass, I think, because it is a more of a physical instrument. Um, but but it's but so like like gra graceful motions, but also using the strength you need on the bass. I think that that's something yeah. that a lot of people struggle with. Is that is that yeah. you're trying to get a handle on that kind of? Yeah, definitely. And it's like the having the you know the strength to hold down the strings and then not having any tension in your bowing hand I find mm -hmm. that hard you know to have like a I guess not a tense and tense you know left hand but a strong left hand and then a really relaxed right hand it's yeah. just it's quite hard to separate the body into those two halves like that it, it really is and I, I'm forgetting even though I've watched you uh, on video are you playing are you French bow or German bow yeah French bow okay that's right so, so for French yeah. bow that's what I was remembering but I just wanted to double check for, for French bow something that helped me years ago was talking to a, a good friend of mine named Andy Anderson he called he was talking about his bow trigger on his right hand for his but and and like yeah. really just thinking about the thumb and the first finger as being the only points yeah. of activation and everything yeah. else yeah, yeah. And, and that's something that but I've also heard it described in different ways so I know that there are different ways yeah. of teaching it but that way when when I started talking with Andy about that I started to relax and I think my bow hand started to get a little bit more it's like I started to yeah. use what I needed and and yeah. And I, to this day, you know, a couple hours ago, I was practicing bass and I was thinking about that bow trigger, you know, yeah, I, so yeah. I, I'm thinking about those fundamental things every single day yeah. too, just, just yeah. like everybody. Yeah. One thing my teacher talks about with the, I guess, with the bow is having, I guess the, um, you have to have all of the weight in your first finger so that rather than any weight coming out of the, the back end of your hand, so mm -hmm. your pinky end of the hand, and she suggested standing in the shower and letting like imagine you're holding the bow and trying to get the water just to run off your first finger, which is the, the kind of that, that gravity thing of having the weight run down, which I've tried. And it's, it's, it is kind of a good exercise for how you do put all of the weight into that first finger rather than having any of it in the, the other part of your hand. But then it's just trying to put that onto the instrument is still a challenge.
Yeah, it's no, that's a great, that's a great, I, I need to try that. Uh, this episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And Steve has been active in the bass world and also the guitar world for years. Here's a bit from our live podcast taping with Steve on how he got into that business. Guitars and basses. Guitars and basses. Okay, how did that happen? They're both helper instruments. I've always oh. played the rhythm guitar quite often with bass lines moving, either in swing style, jazz style, or country style. Bass is the same thing, supporting the band, the group of people you're playing with. So I've always felt like I was a support person. I love how Steve describes being a support person, and he is certainly that for the bass community here on the West Coast, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. His shop is located just south of San Francisco, and he has a large retail showroom with about 70 basses on display. And these basses are professional top of the line bases. These bases are student level bases and everything in between. They're beautifully set up. So if you're looking for a base or you know someone who is, be sure to check out Steve at steveswanstringbass.com. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, Steve. This episode is brought to you by Upton Bass. And have you checked out this new travel base from Upton? Oh my goodness, what a cool looking design. What a great sounding bass. It's just totally remarkable. And the way that they're launching this product, it's just so perfectly upped in. It's uh, bold, it's innovative. You gotta check out these videos of Gary Upton unfolding, I don't even know how you describe it, putting together, I guess, this travel base. It takes almost no time. It is in a Samsonite piece of luggage. I kid you not. It is just the suitcase. It is literally a suitcase base, but it comes together and it's a real base. It's a nice sounding base. So cool. Just another example of the way in which Upton is innovating and blazing new trails for the base community. So thank you for what you do, Upton, and thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Probably just like anything, you know, if you're in a good rhythm for working out or for practicing an instrument or whatever, you know, your practice, your, your habit or your skill that you're developing is, you know, it's easier and it feels good as you get into it. I just took like a whole bunch of time off because I was on the road and I, yeah. I got back. I was at my mom's house last week and I got and I got back on on Monday night. So Tuesday was my first day back at the base really since the end of May. And it felt awful. It was so yeah. <laughs> I was like and, and and I don't know if you've taken a, a chunk of a, a time like that off. I had uh, to move house. And so I took probably three weeks where I wasn't doing very much practice. And yeah, after that three weeks, it was just like going back to the beginning. Yeah. So, so what, so, so uh, what did you, how did you work through that? Or I mean, that, that I always feel if I, I it, it's, it almost feels kind of cool the first moments when I take it out because I'm like, oh, I remember how to do this. And then I yeah. remember how much I've forgotten or how much I've lost. Yeah. And, and um, it's like, like, what was that experience like coming back to it? Uh, and how did you kind of get back into your groove? Um, I think I find for me, if I have uh, some kind of a project that I'm working towards, that gives me motivation to actually work on something. So when I first started playing the bass, I had set myself the goal of playing a few songs at this festival that I was playing. I was playing guitar and my partner was playing bass and we were going to swap for a couple of songs. That was my that was my kind of goal to work towards. And that was that was when we moved house was kind of when this festival was. So I'd, I'd done that and then I was floundering a little bit because I didn't have any kind of project to work towards. And then I think I maybe like a, a month or so after that, I got asked if I could do a gig. And so that was then giving me a little bit of a reason to practice again. So that's for me, if I have some kind of concrete goal to work towards that, gives me the motivation to practice I find it really hard if I don't have a just something so I'm, I'm all for like booking a gig or or you know just putting aside a date for for doing like a little recording or something like that 
so valuable to have something like I think I think probably most of us are like that but I I don't do yeah. well just having this sort of abstract floatiness with yeah. nothing tied yeah. to it you know yeah which is what I find with some of my my private students if I, I kind of wish that some of them had because a lot of them are adult learners and they're just playing for fun by themselves but if they had other people they were jamming with or or you know if I could get some of them to go to an open mic then mm-hmm. I think it would really step up their practice but it's it's kind of you have to really for a lot of people that's a really difficult first step is even just playing with their friends in like a in a jam setting they're terrified of that yeah yeah no it's it's such a great thing you know I, I these days a good motivator for me has been I you know I go to these various events and I see a lot of the same yeah. people at the events and if I play the same pieces every time yeah. I feel so lame so yeah. <laughs> so a uh, motivation has just been to not feel lame and so it's, yeah. it's I've been I've been a big project of mine and I love these these pro- the this series of projects I think this is very inspiring you know what you've been doing um, but a big project for me has just uh, been you know, learning new rap, which I, which, um, has, uh, but if I, I didn't have that motivation of new events. And I think I had 10 years where I basically learned no new pieces besides like random bass gig music, you know? And, and so it's cool. So this current project is, is it the dryad project? Am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think so. I don't know. I've never looked at the actual, (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I've ever said the word out loud. (laughs) Dryad, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Okay. So that's, ve- that's, ve- and I love that you're doc. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Well, everything you're doing, I, I'm a huge fan of. So I'm so glad we're getting a chance to talk. Cause I, I'm also a big fan of like documenting the process like you're doing. I yeah. think that's such a great yeah. thing to do. And it's, it's the tools are there for us these days, yeah. you know, with yeah. the internet and, and it's, yeah. it's really cool to be able to, to do that. So it's, it's, it's great that you're doing that. And then, then your year of practicing base was right before, yeah this yeah yeah and, and then this and then this song project before that and i will make sure to yeah. link up to all of these yeah sure um do you what's what's the next project or is this project kind of indefinite in length this project's a little bit indefinite i'm going to try and keep it going for my 100 days of practice which i don't know 100 days after trying to do a year of something that was that was probably too much so 100 days feels more accessible and I've, I've sort of found it a little bit because my original intention was to try and do something every day like some little bit of original music on the bass but it's quite hard because you still have to keep working on other stuff to then feed into that so I've, I've kind of maybe every once a week or something I'll, I'll do a little bit of writing or improvising with some of the ideas that I've been that I've been working with but then still working on I've, I've got some repertoire that I'm working on at the moment just to help with a few of my current <laughs> sticking points I guess you call them well it's great it's great it's so I find it so hard to and I'm not I I, I like to improvise and I like to write but it's no, nothing I've done a lot and it feels so contrary to improvisation to like schedule improvisation but I've actually yeah. in my practicing app I've actually my last practice item of yeah. the day is jamming and and there's yeah. some, I'm so used to obeying what the practice app tells me to do yeah. that I found myself yeah. actually jamming at the end of the day because it comes up and yeah. and it's easier to just you know do something for five minutes than like close out yeah. the app so. Yeah. What is this practice app? I think oh, it's great. It's it's it. it's called Modacity. Uh, it's, Modacity. Yeah. Okay. It's it's kind of like a workout app, but for practicing. Yeah. And it yeah. is it, it, it. I'm sure it's not just Modacity's. I can hear I can hear everybody turning off this episode now because I talk about Modacity too much. But <laughs> although I, I don't I don't really talk about it too much. But I I do I I use it every single day. Um. I just I discovered it about a year ago, and it's. It's probably not solely a result of that app, but that I, I got it, that app got me back into the habit of regular practicing. And yeah, I, okay, cool. I, I don't know why, but you know, I use apps to track other things, and there was yeah. something about actually starting to do that with my bass practicing yeah. that that got me in the groove. So it's I, yeah. I, I have my iPad on my stand every day with the music I'm working on. I got my iPhone next to me with the Modacity app going. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, cool. Because yeah. I was doing it just manually writing out. And it's like I guess the Pomodoro technique, yep. where you chunk your time into into twenty minute blocks. But I was doing much shorter. I was kind of doing four five minute blocks of time with a one minute break in between, which for me was more manageable, especially in the beginning because you can't really work on something for twenty minutes when you're first starting out. But yeah, it's, I've I've stopped doing that. I've stopped 
kind of making my my manual notes so maybe an app will get it's, me back into well the app is very fun because it also it kind it tracks everything you do so it's kind of yeah. creating a practice log of sorts yeah um uh, yeah. and i'm a big fan of of the pomodoro technique i do yeah. or, or any sort of intervallic thing like that i love it because it's such a simple system but it's yeah. just, there's something yeah. about it, it forces you to take breaks and then yeah. there's something about the urgency of seeing that timer count down yeah for all for yeah. all my non uh, base playing work, like like computer yeah. work or, or yeah. work I do for various companies, um, I always, almost always have a timer going. And I find that, yeah. that I find that so hell. I was doing it, I think I yeah. did five Pomodoros this morning, you know, working yeah. on some projects. Yeah. It's yeah. such a great way to work. Yeah, me too. I do it all for all of my composition. I've got all these little composition games I play with myself and I do them all with a timer. So it, lyric writing or just kind of serial composition games and improvising with number sets or sets Ooh. of notes. I just I put a timer on and then that's my... I usually record whatever happens at the end and then I can go back and listen to it and pull out little bits that I like. I would love to, I'd love to hear more about some of the, that's, you're, you're hitting all my favorite topics, which is like pra yeah. practice methods, you know, um, long-term projects, documenting projects, and then, and then like how creatives work. I just find it endlessly yeah. fascinating. So like, what are some of these, what are some of these games that you're putting through a timer? What, what like in terms of composition? Yeah, I like to work I usually work with words that's kind of that where I start and then I've got um I've been working with a Hans Christian Andersen story called the dryad for a little bit of inspiration and so I've been taking just words out of that and then you can serialize the letters so turn the letters into numbers and then assign a pitch set to the numbers so I, I did this for a lot of the song chain project um stuff that I was working on just starting with a word and then with a set of notes and then just improvising with those notes and seeing what you can come up with whether they become like a bass line or a, a like you can stack them to become a chord and then work from there because I find that if you it's just impossible to start from a blank page so having just a little bit of something and it's also giving you the restriction of having to work within that that um that set which is suddenly a restriction becomes like much more creative than it would be if you gave yourself no restrictions. It, it's, it's, um, I, I th if I remember right, I think w w for your song chain project, did, you were attempting at least this, the next day you, to take like an element from the previous day, yeah, right? Okay. Exactly. Which yeah, is a great exactly. idea. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. So sometimes it was, it was a word from the lyrics or it was like a little, maybe a rhythmic idea or a chord progression so then just using that as the starting point for the next song. And I find that that was really helpful in giving me a starting point because if I'd come with nothing that day, then it would have been much harder to produce something by the end of the day. That's a great idea. I, I need to, I, I, I have found myself getting back into this sort of making my own electronic music, which I find yeah. very fun. And I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm at the point where I'm going to do it every day, but I, uh, my thing is I always start with a blank slate, but, but I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to experiment with that. Like just take a progression yeah. or just something, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Cause there's usually something I liked from the day before. Yeah. I like the idea yeah. of building on the creativity like that. Yeah. And you can also morph it into something else. Like there's all the, those composition techniques like um oh, what are they retrograde inversion mm -hmm. you can play all sorts of games with it um i had a one of my teachers when i was studying he made us do a composition based on our phone number so you serialized your phone number to create both the rhythm and the and the like the m melodic set and then his kind of the thing that he talked about was massaging the composition so you can massage it a little bit change things to maybe make it make more harmonic sense or something but you really need to be strictly like going with whatever the the, the numbers give you so not thinking too hard and like putting your judgment into the process too early which I think is what because I, I teach a little bit of songwriting and I know that's what a lot of my students they're kind of are really afraid to bring in something that they've worked on because they're like afraid that they'll that it's not good enough but just anything is you know you can once you've got something you can work with it if you've got nothing then then it's yeah. really hard to hard to start yes yes and i think you know some of my favorite writers or people that i follow that are prolific you know they talk about 
they they have they have had many successes because it's just the volume of output that they've created. Yeah. Their percentage yeah. might not be that great. It's not like they're batting yeah. 100% or you yeah. know whatever. Yeah. But but just just you know and and that just that that practice that habit of just like like, yeah. like creating it's 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 yeah. it's yeah, it's just like anything it's just like working yeah. out or or practicing the bass or whatever just having that momentum going is yeah is beautiful yeah and that's one of the things i'm i'm really i kind of maybe passionate about trying to communicate is that creativity is not it's, it doesn't come from the like some lightning bolt of inspiration it's it comes out of all of the work that you put in and the more you the more you work on your creativity the more creative you become because I think there's this big myth that like people are just creative geniuses and they're like walking down the street and suddenly the idea for their hit song or I don't know novel just appears in their mind but it, it doesn't it's because they've been doing all these creative exercises and immersing themselves in in art and other things for inspiration and then even though it sometimes does feel like an idea can just appear from nowhere it's a product of all of the work that you've put in before it and I think that makes creativity accessible for everybody and I know that um, I guess you've got a lot of listeners who play um, like classical music so repertoire and so it can feel daunting then if you maybe want to work on some of your own music not knowing where to start and that's kind of a good way of of thinking about it is that you can start from anywhere and you just as long as you put in the work, it's the same as putting in the work for learning new repertoire. You'll start to become more creative the more time you put into it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's great. It's it just it, it, I, I so I'm a fan of what you're up to. This is su- this is super cool. Um, I like to kind of wrap up with some sort of advice question. Maybe yeah, advice sure. advice to somebody thinking about picking up the bass later in life. Uh, yeah. I'm sure I'm sure you have plenty. Um, I would say to get a teacher, (laughs) that would be my advice because it's just, I don't know, it's, it's not something you can teach yourself, I don't think. And there's lots of great resources online, but there's just something about having that, that person there to, um, make sure that you're keeping your technique in check because there's, it's just such a different instrument. There's, you know, you can have bad habits on, on guitar or smaller instrument that don't necessarily do damage to your body the way if you've got bad bad technique on the bass can um and then i think just just knowing that it is a i mean it's going to take time i think it's it's taking a lot more time than i imagined it would but it's i don't know maybe i i think i like the challenge of trying to master it that's what's keeping me going. Yeah, and it, it, it's it's I, I I love how you know sometimes day to day you don't feel that progress, but if you zoom yeah. out, you really do. I, yeah. I've I've been working on this piece that I have not had the courage to play in public yet, although yeah. some of my students are working on it and are playing it pretty well. So I'm like, all right, I gotta get off my yeah. duff and actually play this. <laughs> but I went into my practicing app and I've practiced it. I think. Um, Oh, how many, like, like I have 1,400 minutes of practice on this yeah. piece, just in my app. Yeah. And I, I yeah. had practiced that piece before I got the app. And so, um, you know, and, and I've recorded myself it over, the, yeah. over the time doing this piece. And it's fun to go back like a year ago and listen. And yeah. Like, oh, like, yeah. you know, I've got I think that's actually a good, yeah, yeah that's, that's one thing I would say is, is really good to do is, is to record yourself and then look back because that has given me a little bit of motivation on days when I've been feeling a bit crap about mm-hmm. my playing that day and it, things are just not coming together if I go back and listen to the piece you know a, a few months beforehand I can really see the progress so that's that's kind of nice keeping a record and having a bit of a, a like a, a wider or a um what's the word like more long-sided view of your like both looking back and looking forward so rather than being stuck in that that one moment i i no, i i i know that feeling so well i i like to think of it it's like my actual progress is just this linear line going up but how i feel about my progress and my bass playing is radically different day to day yeah yeah, yeah, I'll think, yeah I'll think sure. i'm so great one day yeah, and then i'll yeah, think i'm so yeah. terrible but if i actually went back yeah. and listened to the recordings of those days I'm a little better than yeah. I was the day before. Yeah. That's generally yeah. how it goes. Yeah. Hey, 
Erica. Thank you for chatting with me, folks. Learn more at ericabremen.com. And we've got links to all these projects we were talking about. Super interesting person. Thank you for chatting with me. And let's do it again soon, for sure. And I'm actually going to be going to Melbourne, Australia in the fall here for Rob Nairn's uh, Melbourne Base Day. So maybe we can do a round two in person, which would be super fun. I really appreciate you listening to these episodes. I kind of forget <laughs> that that I have a show or that there is a show because I do these conversations and they go into Dropbox and I, I sort of, I had a great time. And even if it was, that was it, we just talked and it didn't go out into the world. I would be happy. It's a nice, fun, personal journey that I'm benefiting from every week chatting with these people. And the podcast is just kind of an excuse to frame these conversations for me. So as I kind of forget <laughs> that, that it's a show. And so I'm so thrilled when I hear from people and I get emails and I get them every day. Uh, is just saying, hey, I'm from the UK or I'm from South America or I'm from Kansas and I just discovered the podcast or, hey, I've been listening for a decade and I just wanted to write in and say thank you or suggest a guest or a topic. And it just thrills me uh, because I know that the people listening are guiding the show. This is your show. I am the host, but everybody that I feature on here and that we cover is a recommendation from someone in the community. So if you've got a suggestion or a thought or a topic or anything like that, reach out, feedback at Contrabase Conversations. I would love to hear from you. And if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, the word subscription sounds like it costs something, but it does not. So you can subscribe a variety of ways. They're all listed on our website at ContrabaseConversations.com slash subscribe. Contrabase Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And Mitch is making beautiful, award-winning bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Learn more at MitchMooring.com. And thank you to Krista Copper for cataloging and archiving everything we talk about on this podcast. I'm so thankful, and that helps guide future projects. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.